get started then. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, from wherever in the world you may be joining us today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I am the CFL York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the 14th session of the Emerging and Systemic Risks monthly lecture series, co-organized by YEmerge and CFL York. I will begin today with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territory upon which we are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tikaranto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation and Inuit and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event and our participants may be joining from various locations, I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Jennifer Spinney. Jennifer Spinney is an assistant professor in York University's Disaster and Emergency Management Program. She is trained as a social cultural anthropologist with a focus on raising critical awareness regarding the social and human dimensions of disaster and disaster risk management. In her research, Jennifer studies the various connections between groups of people living and working at the intersections of environment and society. She takes a holistic and comparative approach and draws on qualitative research methods to examine how people make meaning, assess and communicate risk, engage in pro uh, protective action decision-making and recover from disaster and emergency situations such as tornadoes and flooding. Jennifer's work also focuses on interaction and language in use within and across groups to learn how virtual, face-to-face, -face, and individual environmental encounters shape understanding, influence disaster response, and create differing experiences with recovery following disastrous events. Dr. Spinney, thank you very much for moderating today's session. The floor is yours. Thanks, Brian. Thanks very much, Francesco. Oh, no. There's a whole system here that I'm just getting used to. Uh, thanks very much, Francesco, and thanks to everyone for being here in person and for everyone who's joining us online. It's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, again, wherever you're joining us, Mr. Terry Cannon. Terry Cannon is an emeritus professor with the Institute of Development Studies in the UK. Uh, he comes from, like I said, development studies and focuses on the social construction of vulnerability, as well as natural hazards and climate change. More and more, uh, Terry uh, is looking at the significance of culture and the perception of risk, and increasingly, uh, Terry is scrutinizing these concepts that have become everyday in our research, such as community, community-based, and participation, even ideas like empowerment. And when he's scrutinizing these concepts, it's all um, as a way to help us develop more meaningful interventions uh, to, to help people as they are um, combating um, big issues such as climate change. Thank you very much for being here with us, Terry. Um, the floor is yours and I can't wait to hear your talk. Thank you very much. Very nice to be with you. Yeah, it's still on. Okay, cool. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Very nice to be here with you. Uh, I think there's more people online than in the room, which is which is great. Uh, and I hope it's not too early in the morning or too late at night for some of you. So the topic is about uh, what I call these two intersecting injustices, um, which I think are competing narratives relating to 
climate change. And I'm going to explain what I think uh, is, is going on here. I hope that some of you will agree, many of you may not agree, but we can put that into the discussion at the end. Here's the problem. Um, CO2 emissions, only CO2, not the other gases, over the past um, 150 years. And you can see that um, the, um, I'm hoping that you can see on the right hand side, the regions uh, that have emitted these this carbon dioxide. And it's very easy to see that the majority of the emissions that, that are built up, especially since 1950, have come from the so-called global north. And one of the things I'll be talking about is the difficulty of using these categories of global north, global south, um, developing countries, developed countries. All of those um, categories, I think, are faulty and difficult, as you will see um, as, I, as I go on. So basically what I will be arguing is that the problem is not different categories of countries, but class interests and elite interests in whatever country. So I'm much more interested in the relationship between classes than I am in the relationship between countries, because I think when it is focused in the UN system on relations between countries, it leads to great fault and wrongness in how we are going to deal with climate change. So here's almost literally the smoking gun. Um, and the responses to climate change impacts um, since the very first uh, um, conference, um, 1992, um, has been around mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So that starts actually before that in 1988, the very first meeting um, of the uh, Meteorological Office and the UNDP. Um, then adaptation, which does not really become uh, focused on so much until um, 2005, it's late starting, and then also we have the, sorry, I'm just kind of, yeah, becomes significant after 2005, then on the mitigation side, red and red plus begins around 2005 as it, it becomes aware that the problem is not just emissions from burning fossil fuels, but burning and degradation of forests and vegetation. And then more recently, the loss and damage agenda, which is intended to deal with the fact that not all risks can be adapted to. There will be some risks which are beyond the possibility of adaptation, comes on the agenda 2010, and the fund is not established until two years ago, and there's nothing in the funding. There's very little money in, in the adaptation funding, despite the Paris Agreement um, suggesting that it should be $100 billion a year for uh, all the aspects of transfers. And these are transfers from um, the so-called Global North to the Global South to compensate or pay for the damage being done or to help them to reduce their emissions. So I'm focusing much more on the bottom half of this diagram on what is going on for adaptation and uh, loss and damage. Um, I've just realized I'm not wearing the um, radio mic. I'm assuming that the sound quality is, is all right with the microphone in the room. Um, nobody's complaining about hearing online. No, so everything everything's fine with the microphone in the room. Excellent. So focusing on the bottom side of this diagram, and these two narratives, the first narrative is the one that looks at relations between countries. Climate change was caused by the rich countries. And um, um, the effects are global, but the predominant effects are on poor countries and especially the poor and vulnerable people in those places. This is all undeniable. Uh, therefore, the first justice narrative focuses on two aspects of it. Uh, the one is to allow poor countries to burn more fossil fuels uh, to enable the, their people to enjoy development, which usually is code word for economic growth rather than anything that reduces poverty or increases equity. Um, one example of this justice argument um, was the Indian government's insistence that they continue to be allowed to uh, develop coal way beyond the zero emissions targets of other countries. And that was a almost a breakdown point in the COP two years ago. Uh, 
Uh, the other aspect of justice is that the rich countries provide finance to the poor countries, so-called, to help them adapt to climate change and to pay for loss and damage. And this is the part of the $100 billion um, funding that is supposed to be promised after the Paris Agreement, of which we know very little funding is actually going. And in any case, $100 billion is really tiny in terms of all the problems that, that might exist. So the kind of problems involved in transferring from rich to poor countries, if that's what happens, is who gets the money? How, who absorbs the money? Do they have the absorption capacity for that money? But more especially, if they are going to be sovereign transfers, that means to the governments of the global south, countries of the global south, what will they do with it? And is it, um, can governments be trusted to do the right thing with that money? Now, this links up with the second um, narrative, which is the one that I want to focus on, which is that the problem of climate change is not the problem of rich countries and poor countries. It's the problem of elite classes in all countries who dominate the systems of power to bend and shape the, the economies of their countries to the needs of that elite. And so the second narrative is about a focus on class elites and exploitation in all countries. And this then reshapes the idea of transfers of um, funding from the global north to the global south. Climate change is not the reason why people in the so-called poor countries are poor. The, the economic and political systems that have kept made them poor and kept them, many of them, in poverty have existed for decades. So my worry is that the assumption that climate change will make people poorer, which it will, is, is covering up, is camouflaging the reason why people are poor in those countries. Um, we all know that existing poverty makes people vulnerable to climate change, but I don't see very many signs of many governments where there are many poor people, hundreds of millions of poor people, mostly uh, in the rural economy in the countryside, I don't see as a result of the concern about climate change that there are many governments that say, right, our first task is to reduce the poverty of our hundreds of millions of poor people. Instead, the focus is on how do we get money for climate change? Now, of course, climate change will increase the number of poor people, in, um, especially in the global south, by hundreds of millions. This is um, a, a, a straightforward uh, part of the process that will be going on. Um, but the reasons that those people are poor already and have been poor for decades is not going to go away because those countries are operating under systems of class power, which is generating that poverty. Now, in, in the field of development studies, it is now extremely difficult to talk about class, extremely difficult to talk about what are the causes of poverty Poverty has become something which is a characteristic of people, like the color of their hair. Um, it isn't something that is caused. Now, unless we actually understand that poverty has causes, we will not get very far in terms of redressing the reduction of poverty, especially under climate change. The other issue is that the focus on, um, on um, transfers for climate change is that it enables elites, governments and businesses to escape from their responsibilities in what is causing poverty in those countries and to justify extracting more fossil fuels, because there are lots of countries in Africa which are extracting more oil and gas. There are countries which are extracting more coal. And under this supposed justice argument that we deserve development now, um, it's, as, it's as if that the emissions will not harm those countries, which is a quite extraordinary position. So, uh, if we think about poor countries, I'm sorry, I'm just struggling with the changing um, things and, and getting the captions out of the way. It's all right. Okay. So, most poor countries were colonized. Wealth was extracted from them, sometimes over centuries. And we know this, this is very well known. 
uh, and we just at the start of today, we heard the declaration about the land rights of the indigenous people who were colonized, um, massacred, and harmed in many ways by colonists in North America. Uh, so it's it's absolutely certain that these processes have done immense um, harm. Europe's empires also involved the movement around the world of millions of people as slaves and as indentured laborers. And this, again, is without doubt. These are things that happened under European empires. And the systems of exploitation that were established in many of those um, colonies, especially under land tenure systems, were taken over after independence by new post-independent elites for their own benefit. So um, it's, it's well known in India and Bangladesh that the land tenure systems there were established as um, tax collecting systems by the British and which then have been um, maintained despite attempts at land reform um, by the post-colonial governments. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting and is not looked at very much now is that most of the anti-colonial liberation movements, as many of them were known, in Africa, in Asia, were also against elite classes. And those were anti-imperialist, but they were also against the idea of establishing post-colonial regimes which had elites which replaced the colonial elites. And I think we actually need to look back at that. And many of these um, liberation movements and anti-colonial movements had extremely interesting anti-elite class movements as well as anti-colonial movements. So in what I'm saying, one of the things that uh, is necessary is to explain what share of the poverty of um, Tanzania or, or Africa, uh, sorry, or India or Bangladesh, what proportion of the poverty in those countries is still a hangover from when they were um, colonized. Now, th this is when I've given earlier versions of this talk. It's one of the key points that comes up in the questions is, well, of course, they've got lots of poor people because they were colonies. But I think that could be challenged. I don't think you can explain poverty in India or, or Nigeria as a continued function of the end of the colonial empire which was uh, 70 years ago or more. We then need to look at, well, how much poverty of those people is a result of international exploitation under what some people call neo-colonialism or neo-imperialism. So is a, is a proportion of the poverty of the people in Tanzania or Bangladesh a result of the way in which the international system of corporations and governments um, has an effect on their economies and politics, which is detrimental to the well-being of the people who live there. And undoubtedly, that is partly true. But again, I would argue that neither of these are significant large-scale factors in the continued poverty. And my argument is that the poverty of the people who live in the Global South is significantly under the control of their governments, which and those governments are the beneficiaries, they are the elite beneficiaries of the systems of oppression and exploitation which their people experience. So do governments in poor countries find it convenient to blame climate change and the rich countries rather than their own actions and their own inaction? And this is my main hypothesis for this talk is that yes, in my, my argument is that those governments are beneficiaries of these systems which put the focus on international relationships for transfers of wealth from rich countries to poor countries, which enables them to obscure the fact that they are significantly responsible for the poverty of their people. Poverty which is not going to go away just simply because they get funding for climate change. So I think these rich country, poor country categories are very misleading. European colonization of the Global South was a class-based exploitation. It was not all the people in Britain being happy about the exploitation of the British colonies. The elite in Britain were the beneficiaries, the primary beneficiaries of the colonization process. 
And we need to refocus on class interests rather than rather vague, woolly notions of relations between countries. So the people in the supposedly rich countries had very little benefit, um, certainly into the early 20th century, in terms of any higher income or wealth or welfare from the uh, Britain's colonization process. Um, but we also know that there are some countries which became very wealthy without having colonies. Two primary examples would be Switzerland and Sweden. So what this brings questions about is we need to understand the process of wealth creation through colonization in a more sophisticated way than simply saying that colonizing countries brought wealth to the imperial power. There are other things we need to understand. Other European countries had very large empires, two of the largest being Spain and Portugal, which did not make those countries become rich until relatively well into the 20th century, both Spain and Portugal were regarded as the poor um, countries of Europe. Um, and I think that's partly because their col colonial wealth did not kickstart an industrial revolution or their version of capitalism. Um, and uh, again, that's a long argument, which I won't have time to go into, but I think it's particularly interesting that having a, an empire does not guarantee that you bring wealth to the imperial power. And I think that is because of the class structure of those countries, which were, if you like, more feudal than they were capitalist. We also know that some poor countries were never formally colonized. For example, Ethiopia, Thailand, Nepal. So we're having a, a whole review then of these categories of global north, global south, rich countries, poor countries, and so on, because we have, if not exceptions, we have to understand what it is that makes a country rich or poor in a much more sophisticated way. And we also know that some so-called poor countries were and are themselves empires. Um, India, China, Ethiopia, Indonesia are all countries which, the, in the case of Indonesia, after um, they were decolonized from the, United, uh, from, uh, the Netherlands, uh, it was assumed that the elite of that country would take control of the entire Indonesian empire as had been established by the, Indone by the Indonesian elite, mostly uh, from the elite classes of Java. So one, uh, one island becomes the dominant ethnic uh, group, which then dominates the rest of the country. And there have been liberation struggles going on for many years, for example, in Irinjaya, Western Papua New Guinea. We know of the one 30 years ago in Timor-Leste, uh, which was against the legacy of Indonesia having been granted independence as what is de facto an empire. So all of these are complications to the understanding of the simple binary of imperial power, predominantly European, but we mustn't forget Japan as well, or the others uh, and, and the rest. So we need to understand these a lot better because the moral question of the argument about justice has almost automatically taken the argument that it is the rich global north, which is uh, predominantly the old empires plus uh, United States, as the ones who have forced poverty through climate change on the rest of the world. So in Britain, I argued that in fact, the wealth that came from Britain having an empire did not enrich the majority of people. These are scenes from 1900. This is at the height of the British Empire. Scenes of poverty in the major cities of Britain, when Britain was at its most powerful around the world. Where is their share of the imperial wealth? clear signs of severe malnutrition. Now, of course, this wasn't everyone and these photos have been taken in order to produce shock at the time. They were campaigning photos to show the level of poverty that was going on in Britain at this time. Um, hundreds of people were poor and if they needed um, so-called relief, um, they could apply to go and live in what were called poor, um, workhouses, workhouses where you had hundreds of people. This one is in central London, 1911. 
this one also in central London in 1900. The, um, and this is how poverty was dealt with for hundreds of thousands of people at the time when Britain was supposedly rich from its empire. Now, these are emotional photos. So here is some hard data. This is the wealth distribution in Britain. You can see that on the left-hand side of this graph, in 1900, the blue line, the bottom 50% of the British population had zero wealth. And it only ever goes up in uh, 2000 to just under 10% of the wealth. The top 10% of the population, their wealth has gone down in the 20th century, largely because of reforms and the, the welfare state which arrives in around the 1920s. Um, and, but they still, in 2020, have um, over nearly, two, uh, nearly 60 percent of the wealth of the country, is with 10 percent of the population. Now, that's wealth. That is material goods like owning a house, um, a car, um, material possessions, a bank balance, uh, and so on. This is the income, the income distribution. You can see in 1900, half of the British population had less than 15 percent of the income. And the top 10% had nearly 60% of the income. That came down as taxation increased to produce the benefits of the welfare state in the uh, from the 1920s onwards. That wealth went down, and uh, sorry, income went down, and the bottom 50% went up. You can see that as soon as you get ne neoliberal policies arriving around the end of the 70s and 80s, that the wealth, the top 10% goes back up and is now restored to um, around 38% of the total with the bottom 50% of the world, uh, of the British population having only 20% of the wealth. So this is an argument that empire did not produce wealth for everyone. Empires were about an elite group who wanted the empire and invaded other countries for the benefit of the elite that was not redistributed to the population. If we look at India, I only have this data um, since 1995, you can see that with the liberalization of the economy after about 1990, the top 10% increases its share of the wealth and the bottom 50% wealth share goes down. So in, in um, the last couple of years, the bottom half of the Indian population has way below 10% of the wealth. If we look at income, this goes back to 1900. Income distribution for the top 10% is way up there, going up to nearly 60% in recent years. And the bottom 50%, it goes up a bit after independence with some redistribution uh, going on there, but it has now declined back to what it was in 1900. So the bottom 50% of the population in India has not progressed in its share of the income since 1900. Nigeria, which is a country that has exported fossil fuel oil predominantly for uh, over 50 years and has received tens, hundreds of billions of dollars in, in payment for those exports of oil. According to Amnesty, the Nigerian authorities evicted over 2 million people between in that 10 year period that is still going on. And we also know that some of those evictions in um, the capital two years ago were pitched as being disaster risk reduction measures because of people suffering from rising sea levels. So the slums around Port Harcourt, not Port Harcourt, uh, Lagos uh, were demolished with no notice to the people because they said this is going to save you from flood risks. So we have half the population in Nigeria after more than 50 years of immense amounts of income coming from oil exports, not going into the people. Now, I don't think that that poverty can be blamed on the fact that Nigeria was a British colony. And I don't think, um, I, I think it's fairer to blame that on oil companies, sure, for taking out the wealth, but also the different Nigerian governments not redistributing the wealth ad adequately to the people. Now, in these three countries, UK, US and Germany, um, 
these are the tax rates which paid for the welfare state, for welfare benefits for the poorer people. You can see that the top rates of tax, this would be the marginal rate of tax, for example, in Britain, if you earned more than £150,000 in a year, you would pay 97% of any excess of that in tax. And, and the argument for this was that if you earned £150,000 a year, you didn't need any more. That was perfectly adequate to have a very good life indeed. Um, and therefore, if you earn more than that, you should pay almost all of it in tax to pay for other people. You can see that there is a sudden drop in that around 1980, which is the arrival of neoliberal economics in the, these predominant Western economies. So the tax rates now are much lower. Welfare benefits have declined. Poverty has increased. Austerity has taken hold. This is the period in this gap here, which was where the taxes paid for what is called welfare capitalism. And these are the tax rates under neoliberal economics. Now, um, a colleague at the University of Sussex had made a very interesting argument, which I feel obliged to make. Her argument is that the taxation in British India was actually the taxes were raised not to pay for services in India, but brought back home. And she argues that they helped pay for the welfare state in Britain. Now, um, her argument seems to be very strong. Um, and I think that is a fair argument, but it doesn't explain what, why that happened in the United States or in other countries which did not have the imperial taxes to pay for um, those uh, redist redistributions in those countries. And it, it doesn't explain the total wealth distribution that you've got in the ex-colonial powers. And Amartya Sen argued in 2015, ask why does India not have universal um, health care? And uh, he said, what is wrong with um, India is now three and a half times when he wrote this three and a half times richer than it was in 1990 when the economy is liberalized. And you saw from the data that, in fact, the wealth was not redistributed. It, it has been accrued to a, a small minority of the population. And he said, well, why is that not collected in tax which can pay for universal health care? Um, a longer argument, which I don't have time to go into, but he drew um, uh, positive comparisons with Kerala, which had managed to build up a healthcare system. And since that, we can also look at Sri Lanka, which isn't so different from India, but has had free healthcare since 1951 when it uh, became independent. So it is not impossible for so-called poor countries of the global south to have universal healthcare. So we need to be asking what is the class that is controlling the economy and what is its interest or lack of interest in the justice issue of redistribution between different classes. And this came out, if you um, uh, see this video, which I won't have time to show, very short video where Breckman challenges the elite at Davos, uh, the 1% to say, why are you not paying taxes? Um, and the answer to inequality is taxation, taxation, taxation. And um, um, well, you can you can look at the video because it's very interesting because the head of Dell Computing from the audience asks him, well, I think your argument's stupid because which country has ever had tax on the ultra wealthy of 90%? And he answers back and says, well, United States. It had the marginal rate of taxation on the wealthy was 90% for quite a part of the 20th century, which is the one that the graph that I showed you. So I want to move on. Um, uh, 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 this will have to be very, well, I might have to skip this because it's 22 and we need some time for questions and discussion. But the, I'll just make a very quick argument about this. I think that countries in the global South make the argument, we are one of the worst affected countries in the world and Bangladesh, is perhaps the headline country for statements like that, facing flood, cyclone, um, sea level rise, and so on. Um, so what I want to ask is what, who benefits from this narrative about poverty and climate change? And my argument is that the be beneficiaries are the elite groups of those countries who want to distract 
from the attention on why they are allowing poverty to happen in their countries. And so I think this is a, a key part of the argument I would want to make. Um, so you see this emerging in the floods from two years ago in Pakistan, where suddenly it's, it's mentioned that these are a result of, of global warming. And you have a minister of climate change and she makes this argument. And the headline around the world was Pakistan, one third of the country is underwater. Well, actually that was not true. Uh, although the floods were very bad, uh, they weren't abnormal. Um, and certainly one third of the country was not underwater. And this was result, uh, a result of fact checking by the BBC showed that what had happened is if a district administrative local government unit reported there'd been some flooding, then that was counted and one third of the districts had experienced flooding, but not one third of the land area of the country had experienced flooding. In fact, if you look at 22, you can see it's nothing like one third of the country under flood water. And it's not so different from 2010, where the, the in 2010, the, the rain was fell up country much more and then transferred down the Indus into the low lying country at the, at the southern end of the river. So it was as a distribution difference of where the rainfall fell. But you can see that in neither case is it one third of the country underwater. But this narrative became the one and the narrative that it was climate change that was doing it. Uh, of course, climate change has a, has a role in making that rain rainfall uh, fall heavier, but it is not the cause of the reason why people in Pakistan are poor and is not the cause of understanding as to what is going on with uh, flooding in its entirety. Um, I get asked to referee pa papers. This one was a couple of years ago where the headline of the title, the original title was Farming the Floodplain, Gendered Surplus, blah, 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 to climate this vulnerability to climate change in northern Ghana. Actually, uh, you, you can see the title there. So I, I asked in the story that it told had nothing to do with climate change. It was to do with Ghanaian government policies evicting thousands of people in order that Australia could establish an Australian company could put a gold mine on their land. And the people who had to leave to go and find farmland somewhere else ended up in the floodplain the river, which flooded. And I said, well, what's that got to do with climate change? And eventually they produced this rainfall data from a station very close to their research site, which shows there's no sign there in terms of annual rainfall of any increase, which could be attributed to global warming. And so the narrative of the problems of poor people being caused by climate change has just become the default narrative in the, even when data does not support that position. And I'm, I'm going to, um, skip my case study, which would take up too much time, and I want to get us some time for reflection. I'm going to skip to the final. That was on Bangladesh. Um, perhaps here, here is what, what I will show. This is land tenure in Bangladesh. Now, I know it's a very complicated um, chart uh, table. This is from government data, 2017. You can see that the, the red box is landless households. So in Bangladesh, 20%, 27% of all rural households have no land at all. A further in the next box, the red box to the right, 84% are defined as having small holdings. That means less than one hectare. If you combine them into the red box on the right-hand side, in all of Bangladesh, 66, two-thirds of the rural households have either no land or very small areas of land. Now, land ownership is a key determinant of poverty in those countries. So if you have very little or no land, then you're going to be amongst the poorest. Now, that has not been caused by climate change. That is caused by the land tenure system, which has existed since British rule and which was maintained by the post-independence Pakistan and then um, Bangladeshi government after. So, I'm going to skip that. And I think what we have to do is stop excusing those who cause poverty and other problems for their people, the elite class in those countries. We've got to stop using that excuse. Um, we've got to understand what climate change will, will not do to poverty. 
but primarily we have to understand that the poverty of those people is something which is predominantly caused internally within those countries on a class basis with some impact of foreign corporate and, and government interventions which add to that but which are not probably not in most countries the predominant cause of that poverty and i i like this um statement the world is the way it is because those who have power want it to be this way it's just a factual statement that that people who run the economies of the world want it like that so anything that we try to do to improve it to improve people's lives and livelihoods is pushing against people who don't want to change they don't want to change it because they benefit from how it is they will lose benefits if it changes they or it will challenge their ideology of neoliberal uh, market economies, whatever, or they're stupid. And I think many of us see that in, increasingly the ruling elites in many countries are actually just stupid. And this final statement, which is the, the terrifying statement that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to, to imagine the end of capitalism. Um, and I think that's where I will stop and I hope we get some discussion and questions. And um, by all means, send emails if you want to follow on with the discussion afterwards, uh, because I know there's been too little time here, but please do send your comments and um, questions to me afterwards. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Mr. Cannon. That was, that was an excellent talk, uh, intersecting narratives, justice, climate change, it's the topic that should be close to all of our hearts, quite honestly. Um, if you didn't catch it in the chat, um, I will be moderating the question and answer period. I'll be moderating any of those questions that pop up online, but also those that pop up in the room here. Um, I haven't seen any of the questions in the online space. I don't know if I'm just not accessing it properly. So I will first give the uh, the opportunity to people who are joining us here in person. Does anyone have a question for Mr. Cannon? Okay. Um, my name is Nell and I'm a PhD student at the Department here at George. Um, thank you for that. Um, actually, I'm going to move my mind. But, um, so, so it, it almost seems to me that it's governance is, is part of the problem and internal relations, like government and the government. Where, that, where does that leave us? Where do we have to judge people just like me who's, who's going for PhD as well, um, looking at climate change and health in general, um, in terms of ethics? Do we have do we I think we have the right to make a suggestion of to even work in Malawi where we know that most of the power is being controlled by the government and whatever recommendations I may make may not even be looked at or considered. So I mean where does that where does that leave us you know, of work? Do we continue the research? Do we change here and, and change direction and work in Canada where we might be able to make a bigger change than working in Malawi? But then many of us have roots like I grew up in Tanzania. So I would like to give back. You know, it's part of the reason why I'm doing it. Which is right. So yeah, so like ethically, morally, where is that duty? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um a really difficult um <laughs> a situation. Ethically, morally, I think our, our, our duty is to the truth. And uh, we have to find our way in our life while respecting that we should be analyzing scientifically in order to uncover what we think is the cause of the problem. So what I think has happened in, to academia in recent years uh, as a result of the pressure on us all to get funding is that we are less and less likely to be forcing ourselves to look at what is the truth. And, and primarily that means causation. What is, I mentioned how poverty is now a characteristic, not something that has a cause. When I talk to my students back in, in, in Britain, it's a bit of a shock to them to understand that poverty is caused. 
it's a it's a result of processes which are themselves um, related to systems of power. And unless we actually understand understand how systems of power are the ones which cause oppression and um, exploitation that causes poverty and uh, discrimination and so on, we will not um, progress as in individuals and the world will not progress because whatever it is that we try to do is not going to push back at the cause that we are supposedly trying to address. So I think, I mean, that that's very simplistic and a bit idealistic, I realize that, but I think that is the, the first, our duty in, in academia is towards uncovering the truth. What is the process of causation of the problem that we're looking at? Um, and the, the, the so I'll, I'll stop there because we have limited, limited time. Thank you for your question. I'm going to go on, unless you have a follow-up. Is it Derek? Is no, it? Follow okay, follow great. Okay, so I'll go to Malashri Bargava in the online space. Um, Malashri asks, please, can you share some examples of repli replicable strategies to ensure that public welfare programs and benefits reach the most vulnerable communities and empower them despite the entrenched repressive political economic barriers? Hmm. Uh, well, the, tackle that one. Yeah, well, well, the easy and simplistic example of that uh, answer to that is taxation, that, that um, wealthy corporations and individuals should be taxed. Um, nobody needs a, a private jet or three houses and two yachts. Um, the, the idea of taxation on excess wealth was in order to produce a society which was um, not just fairer, but happier. Um, um, Ian Burton, my friend who's in the audience here, we, we've just been talking about the World Happiness Index, which came out recently. And I think it's quite indicative that the happiest countries are those that still have relatively high taxation in order to pay for the well well-being of their citizens. Um, um, and, and so I think that this, uh, th this is about a, a, a justice argument that says, Nobody needs to be paid more than two hundred thousand dollars a year. N nobody who earns that is going to have a bad life. If you earn that, you're going to have a very good life. So then the issue is, well, what do you do with it? And in Britain, that paid for the National Health Service. So I think it's about how uh, you do that. Sri Lanka, remarkably, has a National Health Service, or it did before the crisis of the last um, two years. Um, so it is entirely possible in some countries. So I think I think it's about um, when I've said this in previous audiences, they've said, well, not every country has got the wealth that you can have to redistribute through that kind of taxation. You know, you you if you were to look at Chad or um, Niger or countries like that, well, we need to think about that. But let's at least start with the countries where immense wealth is accrued by the one percent or even the 10% where we could address those issues. Thank you for that. Uh, great question. Again, we have uh, Dr. Sue in the audience. Uh, please uh, share your question. Yeah. Great. So my question is, how do we ensure that people who are not Well, I, I think the key word there is we. Who's the we in doing it? And if, if it's the government, you might immediately be suspicious in some countries that they are doing the right thing. And I, I think the first thing would be to try to find out, well, what would be the best approach to dealing with flood risk of people in slums um, around uh, the coast or, or a river, in, like in Dhaka in, in Bangladesh? What would be the best approach? And... Um, so you would have to start from scratch and say, right, well, is it upgrading the slum or is it relocation or is it a combination of the two? Um, and you might want to start with 
well, what is the cause of why people live in the slums? Um, and and I think that, that Western um, development studies and social science suffers a great, um, we often work in binaries, and one of those is rural-urban, the urban-rural binary, which I think is very unhelpful because the best way to have urban planning is to have rural planning because that then um, might have the effect on how many people are displaced from the countryside, either by extreme events or just by uh, normal everyday poverty. Um, but I see very few governments actually look at that. So the, the best way to um, plan for a better Dhaka or Lagos might be, well, how do we reduce poverty in the countryside, which makes people have to go to the city to live in a slum? And most of the poor people, of course, do live in a slum. So I, I think it's about doing good, again, doing good science and being honest about it. Um, and us as outsiders not assisting in policies which we can identify as being detrimental. A lively discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your question, Dr. Sue. Um, we have, uh, where are we? We're at 12.56. How many more? Uh, how much more time do we have? Do we have, we started a little late. Do we want to end a little late or do we end right at one? We can maybe, okay. Okay. And that's okay for you? Yes, sure. Okay, yeah. great. So next we will move to the online space. Uh, Ali Bali has a question. Don't you believe that climate change in quotes uh, may put an end to poverty in some cases when it causes people to move to other regions? And perhaps stimulating regional economies? Well, I, I can't prove or disprove that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think because many of the people who move will be poor, um, they will they may not stimulate regionally. It, 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 it's relatively easy to look at this in terms of existing migration that's been going on for years. Um, in, in what cases were the migrants um, able to stimulate uh, the economy of the region where they went to live and 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 so you could use that as a, a as a test for this argument but i i think that it's highly unlikely unless there is investment that goes with it for that to happen so for example in uh, bangladesh um, a number of people including myself have been arguing for establishing intermediary towns, um, which are, uh, as Salimul Huck called them, climate-friendly towns, which would accept migrants from the coast as people were forced um, to move from coastal areas, that they would move to towns and not go to the main city of Dhaka, which is already, you know, 15 to 25 million people, nobody knows exactly. And these towns would be the recipients of investment in both infrastructure and private sector investment to establish jobs. So you could have the example, the, these would be similar to what uh, for a very long time were called growth poles or enterprise zones in other parts of the world. And, and so that would be uh, a possibility, but these are migrants who are going with the benefits of investment, which will enable them to have jobs. Uh, the migrants themselves will not have the wealth to generate those jobs. Um, does anyone in the room have another question? Otherwise, I will continue on with the online space. No? Okay. Um, I think I recognize that Duma Jama and Crystal McLennan have questions, but I know that Professor Eggerwell was having some challenges with the Q&A, so I'd like to go to uh, their question, which is, how can 3.5 centuries long words of colonization be addressed in 75 years post independence? Um, and as a follow up, CO2 emissions per capita will make more sense to compare, which is under 10 for China and just under two for India. So perhaps Professor Airwall is speaking to a specific slide and data that you were showing, um, or perhaps not. Okay. Uh, I think it'd be difficult to go back to the slide, so I'll try and take it uh, as it is. So uh, Nirupama's first um, question is about whether or not 75 years of independence is sufficient to make up for hundreds of years of being colonized. Um, yes, it can, if you have the right policies. And 
um, some countries did it. Um, Cuba did it. Um, you could argue that Vietnam has done it significantly better than some other post-colonial um, uh, regimes. Um, you could argue that um, Taiwan did it, or even South Korea. South Korea and Taiwan, um, um, primarily what happened in those countries is because of the Cold War, Western countries, especially the United States, um, enforced on them land reform. And so in the space of very few years, those uh, South Korea, Taiwan went from basically feudal landlord dominated economies to through land reform to urbanized industrial capitalist economies. Um, the, um, their systems um, were implemented by, um, in both countries, by military dictatorships, which were far from um, um, good um, uh, examples of regimes. Uh, eventually, the economy established relatively equitable systems um, with the emergence of what they would say passes for democracy. And for a while, Taiwan had better income distribution than mainland communist China. Um, so I would argue that it's actually in the case of Taiwan and South Korea, within the space of less than 20 years, they fixed um, what had happened under Japanese colonization, um, which wasn't actually hundreds of years, but it certainly was uh, extremely repressive um, colonization. Um, Vietnam from the French emerged as a much better situation than other ex-colonies. So I think it is possible. And I think underlying this question is the um, desire to promote the idea that the West um, um, carried out the evil oppression of um, those regimes. And we can see even in Canada that the oppression of the regime of the colonizers is still there. We talked about it in the land um, uh, introduction um, earlier on. We can see that the um, the elites are capable of continuing oppression um, in a relatively, well, I, I think you, you can get my argument um, and, and I need to stop because we've got other questions, but I hope you can see what I'm getting at there. Uh, the follow-up question was about whether emissions per capita um, are more, um, uh, make more sense. Right, I'm quite happy that we talk about emissions per capita, but I don't think the emissions per capita is the issue that I'm discussing. Um, if we're if we're to look at the way I'm I'm looking at the bottom half of that that slide, which is adaptation and loss and damage. So it's about whether or not money is going to be transferred from so-called rich to poor countries to pay for adaptation. And the question I'm raising is whether or not within those countries there is a class system, a governance system, which would make good use of those transfers of of funds. So. Um, I, I think the emissions, whether you count it per capita or per country, is is not really the issue. Thank you for that. And thank you for your question. Um, we have a, uh, at least two or three more. One of the guests on our program this afternoon asks, am I to understand from the rising emissions graph that our current taxation, recycling and reduction activities has no impact as there is no reflection of effort? Or is that not part of the controlling narrative? Yeah, it, it's a very in interesting question. I think that the the problem with the tax system uh, on emissions is that it does not tax fossil fuels as they come out of the ground. And the, the payments for um, the use of fossil fuels are done through a trading system, which was a very neoliberal policy, which was insisted on by the World Bank uh, and the IMF in the early days of the treaty agreements, um, which it would have been much easier and uh, better if there'd been a simple tax on carbon at the point of extraction from the ground, which would have then put a cost to the externalities that were being uh, caused by the damage of, of climate change. That didn't happen because um, the global economy is dominated by neoliberal influencers who um, don't want to have a rapid and good impact 
Um, so I, I agree that the taxation system doesn't have, eff have an effect. Recycling is somewhat different from that because recycling, in terms of what impact it can have on the total amount of, of emissions, is a tiny, tiny fraction of what it, it, you know, we can all feel good about doing, doing our recycling, but its effect on emissions is a tiny fraction of what is burnt in terms of fossil fuels or deforestation. So it's not really uh, an effective part of it. Um, the narrative that goes with that, I, I think I agree with the people who argue that the fossil fuel companies actually pushed onto individuals the responsibility for climate change in order to distract from their responsibility. So the, the um, uh, reducing emissions at the household level was a narrative which was fostered by, in particular, I believe it was Exxon, who wanted to push away from their responsibility and say it's up to individuals to deal with the um, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases. So I think that's a sub-narrative, which I think has become very powerful, the guilt tripping of people about flights, about recycling and so on, which I think has not been particularly helpful. Are there any more questions in the room? before I continue with the online space? No? Okay. Uh, next question. What is your take on the degrowth movement in the global north? Well, I, I think the degrowth movement, wherever it is, is vitally important. And I think that's part, part of the issue is to how do we uh, create, um, uh, by taking power away from those who promote growth, take um, the measure of human progress to be more about well-being and um, happiness and um, other measures that really mean something for, for people. So I, I think that the degrowth move, movement, which would of course include reduction of fossil fuel use uh, and stimulus of other ways of making energy uh, which do not harm the environment or harm the environment in a much less um, uh, significant way, I think is, is absolutely crucial. Um, Okay, the last question, which is related to something that uh, you confirmed for me in this talk, the power of discourse and discourse's ability to construct that regime of truth. And so related to that, I'm curious, just like this next guest is, what are the best ways to shift the discourse? What are the best ways to influence and educate political will to ensure that vulnerable groups are empowered and that benefits reach the marginalized? Well, I, I don't think it comes through influencing policy. I think the idea that as academics, we have good influence on policy is um, a myth. Um, and certainly from the experience of, of Britain, a whole number of academic ideas about how Britain could improve have been just ignored. Um, and so I think the, the idea that we influence policy in the right direction is very, very difficult to sustain um, in, in empirical terms. I think it's about protests. I think it's about protests by the vulnerable, by the, um, the disempowered, uh, by women, by uh, minority groups, by majority poor groups against the systems that oppress them. And, and I think that is the historically um, where we have seen progress in terms of people having improved lives and living standards. The National Health Service in Britain was not instituted by NGOs going around the towns and villages in Britain setting up clinics. That wasn't what happened. What happened was that there were protest movements which involved trade unions, the Labour Party coming into power, influencing the idea that everyone had a right to good health, that if you were ill, seriously ill, you didn't deserve to die just because you were poor. And those issues of justice are about people protesting against those in the 1% and the 10% for running our world. They run our world. And it's not right that they run our world. And we have to challenge that every time we can. We have to challenge that as best we can. And, and that might mean taking risks. I took more risks when I was younger. Um, I think everyone has to take more risks in, in terms of protests and um, fighting back in ways which makes others realize, yes, the only way to do it is by fighting back and gathering people around us to do that in larger and larger numbers 
so that the people don't get away with it. And this is extremely difficult. And I wouldn't pretend that it isn't difficult, but what I do believe is that unless we do that, it won't change. Any more questions from the room at all? No? Okay, well then join me everyone and thank you for speaking to us from the Institute of Development Studies, joining us from the UK, talking about intersecting in, injustices and narratives of climate change. I want to thank you, of course, Mr. Cannon, but everyone who is joining us in room uh, here and also in the online space. Uh, the presentation is being recorded and will be available afterwards for you to uh, download and view at whatever time you may wish to view it one more time. Um, I think with that, I'll pass it back over to Francesco. Um, thanks very much. Yep, thank you very much, Dr. Spinney. Um, so uh, just to wrap up, I'd like to thank um, everybody for joining us today, um, for participating, for asking questions, for supporting the series. Um, and of course, thank you to, um, to Terry for that great presentation um, and bringing up a lot of important points. I think that uh, a lot of people learned a lot and have a new perspective on this topic. Um, and of course, thank you to Dr. Spinney for moderating today's session. Um, and thank you as well to everyone who joined us here live for this hybrid session. Um, so yeah, and with that, I would just like to remind everybody, this is a monthly speaker series um, or lecture series. And it is the third Thursday of every month. So the next session will be April 18th. So um, just for everybody to mark that down on their calendar and continue sharing um, this within your networks as registration is always open and free. So with that, just one last big thank you to everybody. Um, and I think we can end the session here.